Good morning. Um, we have reached the Song of Songs today. If you are watching um, these videos day by day as they are released, then today is Easter Sunday and uh, may I wish you um, a very happy Easter if you are someone who celebrates Easter. Um, I uh, just to let you know, actually, I record some of these videos. Um, I'm slightly ahead of myself, so I'm actually recording this on Friday. Um, so I am going to get a day off on Easter Sunday if anyone's uh, concerned. Um, but and I nearly didn't release one on Easter Sunday because I didn't want to kind of muddy the water with with uh, obviously the very important uh, thing that we are celebrating on Easter Sunday. But um, because it is this book, I chose to um, release this this video today um, because I think that there is something um, rather glorious about this book that maybe will enable us to see Easter Sunday in a slightly uh, fresh light. And I'll show you that at the end of this video. Um, so Song of Songs, my goodness me, what is this book doing in the Bible? Um, and I don't have a complete answer to that question, but I do have some thoughts and some ideas to share with you. So the Song of Songs, if you have uh, never read it, or if you have perhaps opened it up um, and your hair has stood on end and you've closed it quickly, um, the Song of Songs is a, a love poem. It is in the main a dialogue between a man and a woman um, who are in love. Um, it is frankly sexually explicit um, and uh, it is um, even more clearly sexually explicit in the Hebrew. And if you think a little bit about some of the metaphors that are being used, um, if you open, uh, read the book with an openness to metaphor, you will see um, far more um, sexual content than, uh, than may be immediately apparent. But it is definitely there and not far under the surface, I can assure you, and sometimes right on the surface. So what is this book doing here? Now, this question has um, perplexed um, Jewish and Christian commentators um, since um, since it first kind of appeared in, in, in scripture, really, and people were scratching their heads about it. And there are three broad approaches to that question of what is this doing in my Bible? Um, the first is commentators who have simply said, my goodness me, um, we can't have this, this sex stuff in the Bible and have kind of put it away um, and have uh, said we shouldn't, we, you know, it's a mistake that this is here. Um, there are others who want to take an allegorical approach um, and who want to read this as a relationship between um between God and his people, between Christ and the church. And, and, and Jewish commentators have done the same. Um, so we have, do have this metaphor that runs throughout um, many parts of both testaments um, that represent the relationship between God and his people as one as between a husband and a wife. Um, so there is some validity for reading this kind of allegorically. Um, so that's the second approach that is taken. And then the third approach that is taken is to read this at face value as a song that extols the beauty of human sexuality. Um, now, I'm not sure that numbers two and three are um, mutually exclusive. I think that it is possible to read um, both on the surface, as it were, read it this as a as a, a, a hymn to human sexuality, as an expression of the beauty of it, um, alongside um an allegorical reading of understanding that there is, it represents, points to something deeper as well. And I'll, I'll give you a, 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 refer back to this in a minute towards the end of the video. So let me introduce you to the characters. Um, and this too um, has ambiguity about it. So most of the, in most of the, um, the way through the book, we have um, two characters, a man and a woman who are singing to one another. We also have um, a kind of chorus um, sometimes called the friends who, you know, do you know uh, the way Greek um, drama works that you'd have a chorus who would kind of narrate things. It was a group of people who would speak together, who would narrate things. It's a little bit like that. The friends kind of are acting as a commentary um, on the love of this man and this woman. Um, this man and this woman, sometimes in some of our Bibles, they are entitled lover and beloved, lover for the man and beloved for the woman. Um, this, this isn't actually from, from, um, from the original text. This is our writers trying to be, our, our translators trying to be helpful to us. Not entirely succeeding in being helpful, I think, because lover and beloved implies, um, that one, 
character, the man, is um, proactive and uh, the, the, the female character is kind of very passive and just receives the love of the man. And actually, if you read it, that is absolutely not the case. There is a real mutuality and the woman is really quite sexually proactive in this um in this book. So it may not be the most helpful way of entitling those two people. We also have another character and we have Solomon appearing. Now, the key question here, and I don't have a definite answer to you about this, but I have an opinion. Um, the key question here is, is Solomon the male lover or is he somebody else who kind of shows up occasionally? If he's the male lover, then sometimes the lover is just called the lover and sometimes he's called Solomon. Um, or it may be that we have this kind of slightly pastoral because it's very much set in gardens and vineyards and, and orchards. And um, we have this kind of pastoral relation, this, this, this pastoral setting for these, these two people, maybe kind of ordinary folk, peasants, you know. Um, and then we have this reference to Solomon and all his wedding splendor and and um and it's almost slightly threatening. So um so Solomon makes two main appearances. He's referred to kind of almost just in passing one or two other places, but two main appearances. In chapter three, um verses six to eleven. Um, he is coming to get married. He's arriving in his um, grand wedding train <clears throat> with accompanied by warriors um, on this kind of um, litter, you know, the way that monarchs would sometimes be carried around on a litter. Um, and, uh, and, and in all his splendors, come to get married. And it's not clear how that little snippet connects with the surrounding poem. If, if we understand this, that the, the lover of the whole poem is being Solomon, then, then here he is coming to get married. Um, but it may be, perhaps, that these lovers, these peasant lovers, are kind of almost reenacting their own story of Solomon and the Egyptian princess. Maybe they kind of refer to it because they are, you know, the, the, the woman is saying to the man, oh, you're, you're like Solomon to me in, in all your, you know, in all his splendor, but you, you know, are in your, in your naked beauty are like Solomon. Maybe it's that sort of idea. Um, and then his second place where he appears is in chapter 8, verses 11 to 12, where he sounds actually quite abusive. Now listen to this. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon. He let out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. So here's this idea of Solomon with this vineyard that he rents out for money. And in this book that is talking really exclusively about sex. There is something slightly worrying about that image. And then um, the woman goes on to say, but, but my own vineyard is mine to give. There is some kind of slight darkness here um, around Solomon, some idea of of his use of sexuality as being somehow abusive um, and that maybe he is almost the foil, the dark foil to the love, the true love of these lovers. It, it's not clear. There are other ways of reading this um, and I certainly wouldn't want to be dogmatic about it. However, um, there is something truly beautiful, I think, about the this expression of love between this man and this woman. One of the things um, that has been pointed out, and this is pointed out by uh, a female commentator called Phyllis Tribble um, in a book called The Rhetoric of, I think it's called The Rhetoric of Sexuality in the Bible or, or words to that effect. And she points out how the expression of love between the man and the woman in the Song of Songs um, it, it reminds us of um, the story of Adam and Eve, of the love between Adam and Eve before chapter three of Genesis. Um, and there are a number of things that lead us to um, notice this. Um, so first of all, here we have love in a garden. I've already mentioned it's set in orchards, it's set in vineyards. This couple are um, unashamedly naked before each other and out in nature and enjoying it. Now that should very much remind us of the story of the Garden of Eden. Um, and in this 
idyllic world which the Song of Songs sets up for us. Um, the, the lovers are enjoying the goodness of creation. There is outside space. There is fertile place. There is peaceful coexistence with animals, which are referred to again and again, um, with trees and with plants. Um, yeah, you just imagine this man and this woman kind of walking naked, hand in hand through nature. Um, even the um, the thorn and the tree image um, is positive here, whereas, of course, by Genesis 3, this has become negative. The tree is the place where the humans take their fatal step. Um, the, the, the brambles, the thorns are the things that um, that grow up as a consequence of Adam's um, sin. Um, but here we get these images being used quite positively. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. Uh, that's chapter two. And then um, the woman says to the man, as an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. So bramble and, and, and tree imagery being used quite positively. The other thing which I've referred to already is that in this story, the woman takes the initiative um, and is not condemned for it. Now, of course, the kind of initiative that Eve takes in Genesis 3 is, is highly, um, highly ambiguous, highly, highly critiqued, really. Um, it's not a sexual initiative that she takes there, but that taking of the fruit and giving it to her husband. Here, the woman is sexually proactive, um, and there is no shame in that. There is no um, criticism in that within the book. Um, and here we have this man and this woman in this entirely mutual relationship uh, where both are sexually proactive and neither dominates the other. So there is something um, really idyllic about this um, love poem that is set up here in the Song of Songs. And, and I rather think that um, this idea that the Song of Songs is a kind of return to Eden is, is very helpful to us. So in terms of the relationship between men and women in scripture, um, in Genesis 1 and 2, we get an ideal set out, which is very rapidly broken in Genesis 3. And then as we go through, we again and again see abusive relationships being described between men and women. You know, even Abraham and Sarah's relationship in Hagar is all very abusive. Um, the relationship between um, uh, Jacob and his wives is very ambiguous and they're manipulating and uh, and and uh, yeah, manipulating each other and trying to get one-upmanship on each other and and then move on through into the book of Judges as we saw and the, the deeply abusive things that happened to women by men in the book of Judges and move on through again to David and his relationship with his wives and, and his daughters and what happens to them. It's, it's all very, very horrible actually. And then suddenly we kind of almost emerge from this, this kind of drowning abyss and we suddenly get a glimmer of how it is supposed to be again. So here's Eden. Um, then we get the kind of murky reality and then song of songs and we kind of merge above the, 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 the suffocating waters and breathe the fresh air and remember how it is supposed to be. And then and then we kind of dip below again, I think, um, until perhaps we encounter um, Jesus and his relationship with women. Um, and the way he treats women with dignity and honour and, and is the, the, the perfect non-toxic man, um, which is beautiful. And then, um, and then we see it again in Revelation. So there are these kind of high points in the trajectory. And then in between, we get a kind of description of the everyday reality of life, where actually relationships between men and women are far more conflicted. I think there's something going on there. And I think Song of Songs is a high point in that story. Now, let me just in the concluding moments, say something about why I chose to um, continue with um, this series on Easter Sunday, um, even though we had got to Song of Songs. There is a, a beautiful song by a singer called Michael Card. Um, and uh, if you're kind of, if you like kind of folky music, um, then you might like to listen to this song today. I can't obviously play it to you because that would breach copyright, but I commend it to you. You can find it on YouTube. There is a song by Michael Card called Arise and Come With Me, which is based on the Song of Songs. And um, I have that song going round in my head as I'm speaking to you now and as I was preparing a few minutes ago. Um, because there are some moments in this poem that um, could very well fit 
with um, with the the glorious risen Saviour who has just emerged from the grave. Um, words which could be sung or spoken by Mary as she weeps in the garden and sees um, the sees the risen Lord, her her best friend. Um, uh, unexpectedly and beautifully arrived. And I'm not suggesting there's anything sexual between Mary and Jesus at all, but there is something, uh, there are moments in this Song of Songs story that, that could echo or, or could be echoed in that meeting in the garden. Um, let me just show you those moments. Um, chapter 2, verse 11. Um, the woman sings, my lover spoke to me and says, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. That, that sounds to me like a verse for Easter Sunday morning. Um, chapter 6, verse 10, um, the friends, the chorus, um, say of the man, Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? This could be a song of worship to um, a risen Lord. And then chapter 8, verse 6, the woman says to the man, place me like a seal on your heart, for love is as strong as death. As I say, I'm not suggesting that um, that the, the relationship between Mary and, and Jesus in the garden was, was sexual at all, I'm not for one moment suggesting that, but there is something here. Um, as we ponder this story, as we ponder this mystery and as we ourselves look for words, um, if we're Christians, look for words to um, express our wonder at the un unexpected encounter with the risen Saviour, um, then maybe the Song of Songs provides a new way of doing that. And Michael Card's song, which is a meditation on that, might be something that would lead you into a new way of worshipping today. If you are worshipping the risen Saviour today, then may God bless you. Even if you're not, <laughs> may God bless you. Um, and I hope you have enjoyed this little brief dalliance with the Song of Songs. Tomorrow we move on into the prophetic literature, which is um, wonderful and rich and sometimes mysterious. And we're going to begin looking at Isaiah tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>